Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We meet almost every Friday morning for prayer. We hear each other contribute to the discussion, we pray for one another, and we've journeyed together for more than a year. It's interesting that we always look for stories uh, outside our inner circle, but sometimes we forget those people who are so close to us and how vital their stories is. Well, today I'm bringing somebody who I journey with, somebody with whom uh, I've seen great things of God, and whom is dear to my heart, and I just uh, can't wait to hear his deep story. Tonight at Kingdom Stories from Down Under, it is a privilege to have John Grulis. Welcome, to the, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. So it all starts on Friday mornings, which is sure. the most important day of the week for us, because is, yeah. about a good dozen of us, sometimes 15 of us, we meet together for prayer. Hmm. between 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. That's right, yeah. Before dawn, most of the time. Which is a good time. It is a good time. Are you, are you a man of prayer? Um, yeah. Um, I, I am a man of prayer, but I, I think my prayer life has now become more about listening than praying. So I spend mo most of my time uh, in, with the, my quiet time is mostly spent initially with worship. Yeah. And then I just sit and wait upon the Lord. And then I'll... Sit and wait quiet or with the Bible open, reading or no? No, I just sit and wait and, and basically wait, try and be still. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not easy. No. But, it, but it's about listening to that still small voice and getting to ask the Holy, to submit to the Holy Spirit. So, How long is the worship? A couple of songs? Or sometimes it varies. It, it, sometimes it goes for half an hour or more. Okay. But sometimes it's very short, yeah. And it's not rushed? You, you have the time to do that? You get oh, the, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm usually, I'm an early riser. Yeah. So I'm up about five. Okay. And, and you and start it, work at seven or? Well, I, I get moving about 7.30. Okay, so you have, you have quite a bit of time. A couple of hours, yeah. There's no rush. Okay, that's important, I think. I believe so because I think uh, sometimes we we get into a, a a sense of ushering in His presence, and by the time we do, we have to go, and then yeah, you have it's a rush time. Yeah. You're already thinking so, ahead. Yeah, so I'm privileged, I guess, to have my own time. Okay, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not in full time employment. I have a a small uh, internet business I guess so you don't actually leave the premises you don't leave the no, home. I don't, you work no. from home yes I do oh, which is beautiful and um, do you do it outside do you do it in the home do you do it in, in the, the home. war room in the home okay sometimes I go outside but that's I do then at night time when I go and watch a clear sky beautiful and the posture while you wait on the Lord uh, mostly Mostly on one knee and, and or sometimes just lying flat on the floor. Ah, it's interesting because everything yeah. matters. I think posture does matter. Yeah. It's positioning yourself to receive. Yeah. And that prostrate position does um, signify humbling it attitude. Yeah, it tends to come when one is desperate. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uniform. It's not. Uh, it's not meditated. No, it's not a formula. I try to stay away. I used to get into formulas where I'd read certain things and mm -hmm. decree certain things, but now I try to not. You know, I think the Lord just wants me to be there. The other thing is just happy for me to be there. Yeah. Do you do walks as well? Prayer walks or running or anything like no, that? No, 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 not not no. I do used to do prayer walks in my early Christian walk, but not not anymore. No. Do you live by the lake? Just across I do, the road yeah, here? I do, yeah. Because Paul, who's filming right now, and I, we run around that lake. We run past well, your I, house. I, you do, you do. It's got a fence. It's a 73. Well, anyway, it's, it's got a fence, and uh, it's the second last house. On I the saw street. your car. 
That's yeah, why I knew it was. Oh, well, that's it, man. So if, if we are ever desperate for water. Absolutely. We'll... You can come anytime, anytime. <laughs> we'll barge in your prayer. But, but not between 11 p.m. and 5 p.m. No, no, no. Usually we run at about 5.30 in the morning. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll come and finish off with prayer. <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay. Well, there you go. Small world. Yeah. When uh, did it all start for you, the prayer life? Have you had a, you know, a midlife um yeah, I wasn't. Stir? I wasn't a big. I wasn't big on, on prayer, even initially. I, I'm. It, it's it's strange. I mean, more in my prayer life has been, uh, more worship, than than actual, praying. Yeah. And and uh, and so, my prayer life, you know, I really have to say that ninety five percent of it is not. Speaking. Yeah. Praying about. Yeah. yeah, and that's developed. You know, I, I thought I used to do well. You, you you don't know where to go when you we are around Christians. So I guess um, you just um, basically wing it, and or you get you learn from our elders how how does everyone else do it? And was it progressive or was it? Yeah, there was a shift. There, there was progressive, but I think it got to a point where um, I I started. Uh, I think I got more uh, understanding yeah. on how to just be myself mm-hmm. in the in the time with him, and I think that's because he's all he's made us unique. So he wants us to be uniquely with him, yeah, in our own way, yeah. That we can't emulate anyone else, yeah. We we can't go through a formula, and that that's the that's the danger of getting into a formula. It's interesting you say that because. Um my mom had seven children. Uh, well, I'm one of seven. And right. uh, she was asked by somebody, she said, well, who do you favor the most? <laughs> and she was very wise. I mean, this could have mm. gone down really badly. Because obviously she related uniquely to each one of us. She right. knew us inside out. That's right. And the way she behaved with me was different than the way she behaved with one of my sisters because she knew mm. our love language she knew what we needed but she was very she was very wise when she gave the answer she said i favor the most the one who needs me the most in that moment that's a weird yeah that's a good answer you know whoever needs me the most in that moment mm. that's why I favor yeah. in the sense well wow, that's wisdom yeah, yeah. and i thought man only god can reveal that to a that's mom that's right that's right that, yeah that is uh that is probably a, a, the perf- well close to the perfect answer yeah. because you're not offending anyone. That's right. And, and you're actually telling that person when you're in a time of need or, or him that you're focused on them. And I think obviously to a greater degree, God is like that. He you is. know, when you need him the most, he's, he's always the father, there. Yeah. He's, all, he's always been uh, the father. Yeah. I've, I've, I've uh, long a while back have changed from calling God. I'd rather call him the Heavenly Father or my Father. And yeah. I think it makes it more personal and it doesn't make it so distant. Yeah. Yes, he is God uh, and yeah. he is the Father God. Yeah. And that's what he, you know. Oh, it's it's, it's a, an absolute privilege yeah. to call him Father. Absolutely. I think it's the greatest name that we could ever call him. That's right. Yeah. Uh, from an earthly posture. That's correct. Because that is the greatest figure we can, you know, make yeah. up in our mind with with the limited, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. um, conditioning that we have uh, to see it through those eyes. And Jesus, that's how Jesus introduced God to us yes, as the right. Heavenly Father. Yeah, which is beautiful. Yeah, and one thing about it is, is that I think the the, the understanding of a father is that we have to not compare the earthly father to the heavenly father. No. Because we, we can't uh, put them in the same category because our earthly fathers are also, like us, vulnerable to many things that, that you know, they've, they've probably gone through difficult times as well. And yeah. so they respond differently to different uh, situations or circumstances. So, you know, we have to know that the father is, is almighty yeah. And there is none like him. He is 
you know, above everything, above yeah. all things. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we can't really say, and a lot of people probably do shy away from the Father because they probably had not a good experience with the earthly Father. Yeah, it's the lenses that you look at it. Were you always yeah. uh, a believer? Did you grow up no, in a Christian family? No, no, fa- actually no. no. Oh, well, I grew up in a sort of a Christian home. My, my mum always, um, because uh, uh, she was a widow, uh, she always, um, always reference to God and, and she found it difficult. So in the early, in the, the 50s and the 60s, it was very difficult to be a widow in, in Australia, in a, in, a, in a new country. Probably. So you were born in Australia? I was born in Sydney. In yeah. Sydney. Yeah. And when did your parents come across? Probably in 1946 or 47. Just after, after the, the war? war. They, they were refugees from the war. Yeah. Where were they in Europe? Uh, they were then uh, stationed, uh, I think, in... In a, in a refugee camp in Germany, I think. From? From Latvia. Latvia? Yeah, because... The Latvians or Jews? They were Latvians. Latvians, okay. Yeah. So they... Um, how did they end up in Germany? They were taken there by they, Yeah, they were actually shipped out of there because the Russians were advancing through the Baltic states. Okay. And, and so uh, the Russians uh, were a bit more... Uh, if, uh, more, cruel. more cruel than, yeah. than the Germans. So the, well, mum used always used to say, "Don't don't be afraid of the Germans. Be afraid of the Russians." Yeah. Well, I'm not <laughs> criticizing nationalities, but I'm just saying that at, at that time, well, she lived through the war. Were, yeah, so the, the Russians them, were a bit more severe on on yeah. the the people than what the Germans were. So, and the Germans were retreating, and they were so that's why how they ended up there, and then they end up in uh, Italy and Genoa. Okay. And then they they aboard a ship. Yeah, yeah. Water ships so Australia. It would have been a long journey from Latvia to Germany, Germany to Italy, Italy to Australia. That's years. Yeah, yeah. A couple well, of it, years. It did. It, well, they, like in, a, I think it was 44 or 44 when they started heading down. And, then, and so they were in camps for about three, two or three years. Yeah. And Sydney? Sydney, they, yeah, they actually um, came. They didn't stop. Well, I think they stopped in Perth, but they didn't stay there. They went to a migrant centre in at west of Sydney. Okay. Yeah. And uh, any children at that stage? Yeah, I was. I was the last. I mean, I was not supposed to be here, really. Yeah. <laughs> she was forty-five, and 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 uh, I wasn't. I was the youngest. Of. Of five. Five, okay. Two other, two brothers and two sisters. How many were born in Europe? Three. My sister, who is, was born in 49, was born in Wagga, Wagga, in New South Wales. Okay. That was a camp. Yeah. And the others in uh, Germany or in Italy? In Latvia. In Latvia. Just all, in, all in Latvia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you were born, your mum was 45. When she had me, yeah. Yeah. My mum was 40 when she had me, so, yeah, so they were built, I was the seventh. They were built tough and you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but so, yeah, so anyway, we had, we were growing up in a household that didn't really acknowledge God as I know now how to acknowledge him. Yeah. But, but the, we, she always referenced him that he would always watch over us and help us. And was she from an Orthodox? Uh, I think Eastern it was more Orthodox? Lutheran. Lutheran. Okay. Yeah. And dad? I think he was Lutheran as well. Okay. And how old were you when he passed away? I wasn't born. Oh, what happened? Well, he, he got, he actually was um, an electrician and he was working on the electrification of the train lines from Sydney to go west. And uh, he was help. An, an apprentice was up in a, I don't want to go into too much detail, but an apprentice was working on the lines up in the box, in the switch box, and something happened. So he went up to help him and he got a shock and they both fell and he fell on the railway lines and crushed his lungs. So it took him a while to pass away because they couldn't do anything about internal bleeding in those days. So That's so sad. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I never knew him. So, But, you know, uh, when I became a, a believer... I saw how much the Heavenly Father was watching over me. Yeah. I, I, I didn't realise it or acknowledge it at the time going yeah. through my life. And I wasn't born again until 1990, so I was about 37. Did your mum remarry? No. 
she chose to remain a widow. Yeah, she remained, remained a widow. That would have been tough for her. It was, it was. And uh, that's what, probably the reason why I left school, yeah. So she lived just on... Uh, pension. Pension. Mm-hmm. Like what the that government... Was it. And with was, government housing as well. Yeah. Whereabouts in Sydney? In Windsor. Okay. That's that, about 50 kilometres west. Near. It's actually not far from Balcombe Hills, which is Hillsong area. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what's your first memory of childhood? Wow. Four or five? Yeah. And, and all the different nationalities that I, I was living with in a, in a migrant centre. They came from all over the world. Oh, so you were still uh, in a... When I was young, when I was about five, yeah, I didn't leave the migrant centre until I was about nine and we moved to Windsor. So she stayed there for a good 10, 11 years more? Mm, in the migrant centre. Yeah. Mm. Was that like state housing or what was it? Yeah, well, it was, government, it was federal government housing for okay. migrants. And then you went to a state housing. Okay. From there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Interesting. Mm. And uh, obviously there were Vietnamese. What were? Not Vietnamese. No. It was, Not yet. No, no, no. Mostly Polish. Croatians. Mostly Eastern Bloc. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, not at what what they call the Eastern Bloc. Uh, East Germany. Sp- yeah, Spanish as well, and and all, all most European nations, mm-hmm. even some Romanians as well. Yeah. So they had everyone there, Dutch even, and so there was a lot. So of that's your first sort of memory, playing sports, playing... Yeah, the... well, learning how to play, yeah, cricket and all that thing. So I grew up it really as Australian. Did you, mum, teach you Latvian? Tried to, but I, I sort of... Um, Dodged it. I didn't want to do it because it was there was a stigma about being speaking another language. Mm-hmm. And so I would answer her in English. But I understood exactly what she was saying. And you were all the brothers and sisters? They spoke. Oh, they spoke Latvian, but yeah, they spoke mainly Latvian, but they all spoke English. You know? Okay. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah, it is. But so in Windsor. So in Windsor, I grew up, and uh, uh, yeah, I just went to school and really enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed it. I, I yeah, I used to have to go two kilometers to school. By bike, no, or walk? walking, yeah. And then I got then when we could afford a bike, I got a bike. But yeah, and then but I'd meet up with my friends along the way, and we'd all walk together, and yeah, you know. And, uh, but yeah, so pretty streetwise. You became pretty yeah, streetwise. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Windsor, Windsor was a right. decent town until until um, probably nineteen seventy when the drug scene came in, and then Windsor became one of the one of the well, second in the state for crime and drug. Like so, but I, I, I left by then. I'd left in 70. So. Where did you go? I joined the, the Royal Australian Navy at that time. So you left school at what, 15? 15, 15, 15, yeah. But I, I tried to get in the Navy at 15, but they, I wouldn't accept me, so I tried again. So I went to work in Burke for a, for a while in Western Sydney. Yeah. And uh, in the country, and then came back at on 17. On a farm? Yeah, on a farm. And with, with indigenous people, no, well, yeah, I was because it was a, a farm. Uh, the, the owner was American. He was growing all sorts of fruits, like melons and everything. And so, uh, and and we worked a lot with indigenous people at that time. You know, which was a pretty good experience for me. Yeah. And then uh, coming back at seventeen, I, I got into the navy, yeah. and uh, but you see, it was. Getting into the Navy was uh, my desire. Yeah. I don't think it was God's desire. For me. Mm-hmm. And so... What drew you to the Navy? I, I just love the ocean. Yeah. I love the ocean. I love the sea. Uh, I love the ships. And, and so I really wanted to make it. I thought that was where I needed to be. But um, after being born again, I realised that it was my desire and I enforced it upon my... My mother didn't want me to go in the Navy. Yeah. But I, I forced her to sign the papers, and she did, and because you were under 21 at those yeah. days. And she got me, I got in, and then after about three years, I realised that this was wrong. This is not where I needed to be. Did you get a trade? I, I started one, but I, I just I didn't complete it. So uh, I, I asked for a discharge, and because my mother was a widow, they gave me an honourable discharge. Okay. Normally, it was very difficult to get out of the Navy. 
would have been an eight year gig. three year, it was a nine year sign on and okay. I, I did three mm -hmm. and so uh, then uh, so you were 20 now I was 20 and well I still wanted to travel but I didn't want to travel Navy style yeah and so I I um, took a one-way ticket with a friend of mine to to Europe mm. and I and I looking back now I think this is what that the Lord really had planned for me. I, he, he, but he gave me all my heart's desires because I, um, I met my wife there, which I had no intention of going over to Europe and meeting a, a wife. But just before that, mm -hmm. the Navy protected you as well from drugs, from Everything. Yeah, alcohol, they actually did. women, they actually, they actually did. gambling, Look, whatever. It, the best time I had, I think it was really good at that age for me to learn discipline yeah. and to learn independence yeah you had to learn how to iron make your bed clean your yeah. butt so it really taught me some really good ethics yeah and and i and i i think it's it's very important that's why and you I, shave every morning right yeah probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 thing is is that it, it i think it, every young man they, they probably would shy away from it but any defense job uh would give them some sort of independence and confidence yeah. to go out and well, I didn't wouldn't have had the confidence to do what I did. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it was a great grounding. So what did you do in London? Well, I worked or in London. Uh, well, we travelled around Europe, you know, yeah. the beer festival, because I wasn't a believer. So you and your mate? Yeah, but then my other friends come over. But money, my, you? Saved. I had not much. No, I, I used my. Um, Super, what I had in the navy, which was not much. It was seven hundred dollars. So I yeah. paid three hundred for an airfare to Athens. Yeah, and then me and my friend hitchhiked to London from Athens. What a trip! Yeah, it was. It was an amazing trip. But it took us three weeks to get there. Yeah, and sleeping under bridges and on autobahns and all that stuff. And it was an experience. But then we we moved into a flat and uh, we you know, initially didn't have the finances to do it, but Australian. People were in the flat and they helped us out and got us a job and and so. What did you do? Well, actually, I did everything. I drove a forklift. I I worked for an agency and you had to be on call for any any type of work. Yeah. So I did all that, but then uh, I met uh, my wife who was uh, French. Where did you meet her? I met her in London. The thing was, was she had a girlfriend who her her, her girlfriend's boyfriend. Uh, were staying with us on and, and his mate. But uh, when they wrote to them, to, to his girlfriend to come over, she couldn't speak English, but she had a friend who was my wife now, could speak English. Yeah. So she brought her along. And by the time they got to our flat, those two guys had moved on to Northern Ireland at the time. And so I met my wife and, you know, when I look back, I, I actually prophesied over her. I said that, my love was in France, but she doesn't know it yet. Yeah. And she was like, man, he's a bit forward. She told me that later. But uh, basically I met her there and uh, and uh, she invited me back to her place. But I, I thought, oh, well, you know, they all do that. But she did call me halfway through and she said, are you still coming? So I went there. My friends went to the beer festival. I went to her place. And then I have you a You crossed sister. the channel by both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Southampton to Sherbrooke. And then hitchhiked to her place, which was about 200 k's, which took me about eight, nine hours to do. That. It was a little race. But then... Just uh, with English? She did. She spoke... No. Uh, hitchhiked just with, uh, with English? With English, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't speak a word of French, not a word. And so, yeah, it was a struggle to get there, but I eventually got there, you know. And I, I, I learned from the Europeans, they put a sign up to where they're going, so yeah. I, I used to do that. And so I put her town up, so that was there they are. And so I, I didn't, I mentioned that my eldest sister, she had moved to, she married a Dane and went moved to Denmark in 1960. Okay. So she's been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I... Closer to home. Well, to yeah, but she married a Dane. And so Janine and I uh, hitchhiked from her place, which was in the west of France to, to Copenhagen, where she lived. And we, oh, so you went all the way to Copenhagen with this girl? With this girl, yeah. The mother didn't really trust me because when I arrived, I, 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 I used to drink Jack Daniels at the time, so I brought a bottle and I thought they, did, they didn't. And no one smoked in their house. I smoked and then I was terrible. It, was, it wasn't a very good first impression, but 
uh, you know, when I realised that no one smoked, no one did anything, so I stopped everything. And, but then uh, the mother was really apprehensive about letting my wife come with me. How long did you stay there before you went for It was only a, a, a week. Mm-hmm. And, and you stayed with them in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a room for me and everything. And so, um, because the sister, she moved in with her sister. And so uh, the mother then put a, put a condition on it that if I bring her back by the 9th of September, then I would go. go. So I did bring her back by the 9th. We got back on the 8th. And so her mother trusted me after that. And, and she was safe. She wasn't harmed. So it was you know, exceptional. So then I met Janine and then I came back to Australia in January. By was, yourself? Yeah. I met her in August. Yeah. And, I came, and we'd spent six months or so, five months. And then I came back by myself in January. And Janine followed me the following uh, yeah. July. Yeah. And then she stayed for six months and went back in January 75. Yeah. And then I followed her in May 75. Back to France. Yeah. And then I ran out of money uh, at the end of the year, which was about November. So then I went to the UK and I went to the North Sea. And, I, and I, that's where I think God gave me my desires. I wasn't a believer, though. So you went to work? I went to work offshore in the North Oil Sea. Rig. Oil rig. So I was on the ocean, but on the freezing ocean. I've never worked on the ocean with snow, but I was, I, I was nearly ankle deep in snow and on, on a drilling rig out there. And, and so that's, that was my life for the next 24 years. Wow. Mm. And uh, Not there, but all around. You got know. married? Got married in 76 in London. Okay. And then by through, you know, registry office because... Yeah. We, she wanted to get married in France, but in France it was a six-month wait because you had to do could sort of convert to Catholicism and I didn't want to do that. And, and little Janine had no interest in Catholicism. As actually, she found it hypocritical at the age of 14 to, to say confession you had to lie. And yeah. <laughs> anyway, so she didn't go into it. But basically, um, yeah, I, um, we got married in, in London in a registry office, and very simple. But so we had friends and my sister. So then came. you flew to the, or chopper to the... I used to fly by chopper to the Royal Rex, yeah. And then was it fly in, fly out? Or for fly a number in, of fly days? out, two, two weeks on, two weeks okay. on. So I used to travel, um, I used to go at the rig for 14 days and come back, take two days to get from Aberdeen to London, then London to Paris. Uh, to, to her place in, in the west of France. Oh, so she stayed home? She was living at home. That was oh. before we got married. Okay. And yeah, then, but then in London, she was living She was living in London. What was she working? What was she doing? Uh, she was doing a, a business, she was working in a business college. Yeah. She was actually a facilitator teaching a director's secretaries how to be. A, yeah, that was her nice. profession. And kids? Did you have the children, children there? Yeah, we had... Uh, John, my eldest son, Jonathan, was born in France in, in 79. Mm-hmm. But we left France in 82. For London? Or for Australia. For Australia. Oh, so from England you went back to France for a little while. For a little while, and then I, I actually um, I got a job. So from 76 to 82, I lived in France. We, we lived okay. in France. And you and were so did, working on rigs. Yeah, and then I got a job with a French drilling company, and we they sent me all over the all over the world in Iran and Nigeria and different countries. And she would travel with you? No, no, she I stayed just home. I did five weeks. On, I mean, the guys complain now, but I did five weeks on, five weeks off. Yeah, but it was good on the off time. Yeah, yeah. and then you decided to come back to Australia. Decided to come back to Australia and um, started working in the oil rigs in Australia. But your, I came your back French was pretty good by now. Well, actually, the, yeah, I was. Actually, the first couple of years, I didn't, couldn't still understand, and my, my mother-in-law really persisted with me and, you know, repeating repetitive words, and, uh, and then it just it all came to me, and, yeah, I could speak enough Fluent. to get by. And so the French company hired me for that because I could speak English and Slumber French. Day. No. Well, they Slumberger owned the drilling company. It was okay. called Forex Neptune. Okay. But Slumberger owned Forex yeah. Neptune, and so we we worked everywhere with them, and uh, yeah. And then I came back to Australia. Sydney or Perth? No. We came back to Sydney and we stayed there for five months, but there was no work for me for oil there. So I heard that Western Australia was a place to come. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, when I got back to Sydney, I didn't want to really bring my son up in Sydney. He was only two and a half, three yeah. years old. And I just didn't like the environment in Sydney at that yeah. time. It had changed dramatically since I'd left. And so we bought a van and we just put a mattress in the back and a bit of a cooker and we just drove across Australia. Awesome. Yeah, it was different. Bit of a nomad. Yes, it was. And, uh, yeah, but we had, see, there, there was a plan because uh, we, we went to, uh, we got as far as Norseman and we met this older couple, elderly yep. couple, and uh, my our plan was to go to Kalgoorlie because I wanted to see Kalgoorlie. I've heard about Kalgoorlie. And they, she sort of talked us into going by Esplanade, yeah, because she said it's a pretty drive and all that. So we did. We went by Esplanade, but we didn't realise that. Um, I think it was just twenty k's out of Raisin Thorpe, which is about a hundred and something k's from Esplanade. Yeah, we rolled. We we rode off the van. Oh, everything. We had, we had a trailer full of our trunks from Europe, all our stuff, all our thing, and uh, we we had an accident. Um, Did you hear something or just no, no, no. Actually, off the road? No, yeah, I think if I'm honest, and I am, then my son was in the back with my wife on the mattress and where I was driving, and then he was climbing over the seat and I was trying to grab him. So my the car veered to the and they, they had no shoulders on the side of the road and the, the trailer started jackknifing on the road and so yeah. I tried to correct and then when I corrected, over we went. And we ended up about 100 metres down the road on the other side of the road. Windscreen popped out un- upside down. And they had no seatbelts. I had to, I grabbed hold of him. Yeah. But my wife was tossed around like that. But nothing happened to us. Wow. Not a scratch. It's a miracle. It was. And we didn't, we didn't realise it at the time. But after, when I, when, the, when I, when I accepted Jesus as Lord, all these things came back to me. Of course. How he Flashes. Saved, yeah, how he saved us. It kept us for a purpose. Yeah. So when we have a purpose, it doesn't matter what the enemy puts in front of you. Wow. He'll keep you. So big shock, obviously. Was well, lost a yeah, lot. Of, yeah. Well, but we were fortunate. This is how good God is. About five or ten minutes after it happened, two couples, two different couples with two caravans came. They saw what happened. They pulled the caravans over. The the women started setting up the table, making us some food. And the guys all helped me put all the stuff back together in the right. trailer and, and the van because they knew that we were going to tow it away. And, and the police came and uh, took us to the hospital, get us checked up, but we were fine. Then the hotel. In Esperance? No, this was in Ravensthorpe. Oh, Ravensthorpe. It was bef- before. Yeah, the mining town. Yeah, well, yeah. Now. And so, uh, yeah. And so they put us in the hotel. The guy wanted to put us upstairs, but the wife said, no, 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 put him in the units out the back. Yeah. This is a young couple with a child and we don't want to. So they actually looked after us. And when it was time for us to pay them, yeah. she wouldn't accept them for five minutes. Wow. And then that lady, we rang her up, that lady that gave us, told us to come to Esperance. We didn't have anyone in Perth. We didn't yeah. know anyone, know anything. Yeah. We just rang her up and said, look, we're catching a bus to Perth. and We rolled the car. Yeah, we, we told her all that and she was amazed and, well, s- saddened really, but amazed that we survived. And, and so she, we just said, look, we're coming in on a bus. And so we didn't know. We got into the Perth bus station <laughs> and there was a message for us to call her. Yeah. So she called us and uh, called her. we called her up and she, we took a taxi. She told us to take a taxi to her place. So she put us up. And I went house hunting and found a place to stay in, in Herdsman Park in Wembley. Yeah. In one of the units there. Yeah, that is. It was a furnished unit for about, yeah. So I stayed there. We, we, I live next, I live in Churchland, it's just around the lake. Well, I lived in 115 Herdsman Parade. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but so I lived there and uh, then we actually, um, I got a job. I got a job eventually in 83. With a, with a, in, in the oil rigs again, and um, 80, beginning of 83. And so we had some work, and then we, we put a deposit on a house in Kingsley. Nice. Yeah, it was. It, Where you are today? Is it the same? No. No, 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 no. It was a house in Kingsley Drive. Okay. And uh, so we put a deposit on a house, and, and from that house, we, we stayed there 19 years in there. Beautiful. And then, uh, but during the time, uh, 
uh, the oil rigs went down, so I had to work as a car salesman, and I'd never sold a, an encyclopedia or anything. So it was really tough because um, they they would give you a, a very a retainer of one seventy five, and you could get two hundred forty a week on the dole with a child. Yeah. yeah. So we we did we toughed it out, and and then um, I uh, this is where the Lord. I was not a believer then. This is where the Lord came into my life big time and I didn't realise it. And so I was playing the stock market in 87. Yeah. And you could get a phone account, put in a phone account and yeah. I had a, I had a Trade. portfolio of about the 20000 worth. Wow. But it was worth 30000 but it, it cost would have cost 20000 but it was all on account, on credit. Oh. And then the, my wife said she didn't want to have that she wanted to have the finances, not the certificate. Yeah. So I called the broker to sell, and he said, look, it's on a bull run, leave it, and a couple of weeks, and that was on the Friday. On the Monday, it, the Friday happened, Black, that was where the stock market crashed, crashed in 87 October. And so I was left with a 20,000 debt and a mortgage and $175 a week. Yeah. And everything was gonna be taken away from me. Yeah. Everything, the house, yeah. everything. I went to my bank that I'd been banking with since I was at school, and uh, I won't mention their name, but they didn't, they couldn't help me. So I was walking back along Kingsley Drive, and I just happened to look up the street, and there was a bank opening up in a shopping centre, or it looked like R and I Bank, it was called then. Yeah. So I went up there, and here's this guy changing a light bulb in the ceiling, and I said, "Oh, is the is the manager in?" He said, "I am the manager." So he was actually. He, he was a, a roving manager that started up banks for, for R&I. And Bankwest, I, which became... Bank, big became Bankwest. So I gave him, I, I don't know why, but I told him all what, he, he asked me to come in and You chat told with him, him everything. I told him everything that happened to me. And he said, look, we'll, we'll advance you the money. Uh, you'll have to pay the interest up, but you won't have to pay it up front. You'll have to pay it at the end of the, the term, the year. Yeah. I told him I was on a promise to get a job in back in overseas in November. This yep. was in eighty seven in, in October, and uh, he then uh, he said, "All right, you you keep your mortgage with that bank because it, I was on a fixed term. Otherwise, I'd have to come on variable." Yep. And so we transferred all our money, three hundred dollars, over to his account, and he they they true to his word, we. Um, I got the job. I eventually got the job, and we paid off the debt in in September the following year, a month before, month before we needed to. Oh, praise God! Paid the whole debt off, and yeah. So and and the Lord, I mean, took, led me to that bank, yeah. to that person who was not on a that believer day. either on yeah. that day. Yeah, because the enemy wanted to wipe me out. Yeah, but the Lord did not want me. When did you encounter the Lord? This is this is the this is where I where I'm really I believe that this is my testimony. I was working on the oil rig in in Brunei. This is the job I got in that '87. Yep. And in uh, I was there in 1990. I mean, I was working with a guy called Vince Tilly, and I'd met him before. He was a Rhodesian ex SAS soldier, mm -hmm. and he was he had a tough life. Yep. And and so he became a believer. Yep. And he was. You know, he's very. He was actually very. Um, he wasn't a gung ho evangelist. He was yeah. just. He was just living the life. But he also, and he gave me the testimony after. He said he had been praying for me mm -hmm. every month. Every for four months he prayed and asked the Lord, "Can I give John a Bible?" Yeah. And the Lord said, "No, <laughs> not yet." His answer was not yet. Yeah. And every month, every every day he was praying. The Lord said, "Not yet." Yeah. Not really. Okay. So he did. He then said, all right, give him the Bible. So he gave me a Bible, and we've got cabins on the oil rig. And um, so I looked at the Bible, and I thought, I, I just couldn't get it. Yeah. It just didn't make sense to me at all. Mm. But I thought it looked good. You know, it's like a hotel. I've yeah. got my little Bible next to my bedside table. And then two nights after that, he said, you've looked at the Bible. I said, oh. He said, look, I've got, a bit, I've got a testimony I want you to look at. A video. I said, oh, Vince, because when you work on the oil rigs, you work 12-hour shifts. So I, you, I'd start at 
12 at midday and yep. finish at midnight. Yep. So when I finish at midnight, I get in and do my reports. I go and have a meal. I have a shower, then have a meal. And by 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, bed. I'm in bed. And then up at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I, I, I said, oh, no. And he said, just five minutes. I said, all right. I came, went down, went down to the TV room. It was, a, it was just him and me. Well, he, kicked, he told the others to leave because they were watching some adult movie. Mm-hmm. So he got all that out. And he put the testimony of um, Ian McCormack. Have you heard of Ian McCormack? No. Ian McCormack is the guy that was <clears throat> bitten by, stung by box jellyfish that died mm-hmm. for 20 minutes and came back. Yeah. He was, a, he was a guy that his mother was a spirit-filled born-again believer in New Zealand. He was a New Zealander. Okay. Travelled around. He gave up. He said, Christianity is not for me. He tried Muslim. He said, oh, you know, he wasn't into Christ. He, he was brought up as a Christian. Yeah. But he, he tried Buddhism. He tried, he tried uh, Hinduism. Muslim, or he tried all those things. He ended up surfing. He was a surfer. Yep. He ended up in Mauritius. Yep. And in Mauritius, he um, got to know the Creoles and he used to go diving with them for um, crabs, I think it was, crayfish. And so this one particular night he went and he had a three-quarter wetsuit <coughs> and he um, he actually he actually didn't realise, but uh, they call it over there the invisible because you can't see the tentacles of the boss jellyfish. And he got stung, he got stung five times, and you you die with just one. It's called the Portuguese man of war or the box jellyfish. And so, he, he it's a long story, but I would encourage everyone to go on a glimpse of eternity. Mm-hmm. It's one word, a glimpse of eternity, and have a look at his testimony. But so his testimony was was that um, Vince and I was in the room and I was watching his testimony and he was uh, he was dying. And at the time that that was happening, at two o'clock in the morning, the spirit woke up his mum to pray in the spirit for him that his son was dying, and he was in Mauritius. And so she did, and uh, well, a long story short, Ian. What he saw in the 25 minutes that he was dead uh, shocked me. And what he saw was that he was he was in darkness. Initially, he was in darkness, but it took him a while to pass away. But he was in darkness, and he thought he was still in the hospital bed, and he thought the lights were just turned out. But he um, then tried to touch. He felt he had a body, yeah. but he tried to touch himself, but he, his arms went through and... Anyway, it was a very powerful testimony that really impacted me. And, and basically, he, he said that uh, he had, he, prior to dying, he, he had seen in a vision, he was lying in this bed, in, this, in the vehicle that was taking him to the hospital. He saw the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. And he prayed the first half of the Lord's Prayer. And it's basically also a prayer of, of repentance in a sense. In, and so that's what he took it at. And so when he was in darkness, all he w- was surrounded by was cold and, and anger. He felt a lot of anger around him and voices that were saying, you deserve to be here. You, you, it was just, and he didn't know where he was. And so when he cried out, he cried out, Jesus. Then that light shone into that darkness. And then he started being drawn like a moth into that light, to this light. And so as he was getting into the light, he saw the aura of his body. There was no physical body, mm-hmm. but all his fingers were there, all his, all his legs, arms, toes, yeah. everything yeah. was in the aura. Yeah. It was a spirit being, he realized he was. And every time he came closer to the light, he felt more shame of what he had done in his life. But every time he felt that shame, he felt waves of love hit him. And so as he drew closer, there was more love hitting him as he was feeling. He, he felt by the time he got to that light, which was so brilliant, but not blinding, he felt that he, he, he had to find somewhere to hide because of his shame of his life. But the more he felt that, the more love filled him. And so that really impacted me. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I think I was... Um, I think the fear of God came upon me. The, the, the fear of, I guess it was the fear of not going into that dark place 
Yeah. I didn't want to go yeah. there. And my life, if I wouldn't have changed my life, because during that that video, I'm, this is amazing because Vince had to go out for a minute. Yeah. I was he by myself. Alone. I didn't know I was there because he was a night supervisor. Yep. And about 20 minutes into the video, well, when he had seen that darkness, there was a voice that came that I, I thought it was Vince. And he said, yep. the voice said, John, you need to change your life. And the voice said it again, John, you need to change your life. Mm-hmm. And I looked around me no one and I thought he was, I thought oh. Vince was trying to Convince play games with yeah, me yeah. In, in telling me to change my life. Yep. But it, it wasn't him. There was no one there. And so after the video, I was like, I, I, I just was stunned at what I saw. And I ended up staying the whole video, which was an hour and 15 minutes. Wow. And then I went to bed. Well, I couldn't go to bed because all night I was thinking, how do I change my life? I couldn't work out how yeah. I would change my life. So I asked him in the morning and he said, you have to give your heart to it's Jesus. Yeah. And so I said, all right. We went in our cabin and got on our knees and he led me through the prayer of accepting Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Was it real for you? Oh, yeah, on the rig, yeah. It was like night and day. My crew knew what I was like. I had yeah. a pretty profane mouth in those days. Mm-hmm. I th- that was the norm Yeah, for us on the rig. You had to have this macho image on the rig to survive, I guess, this toughness. and uh, But my crew just knew there was some massive change in me because the next morning or the next shifts that I was on, the last four shifts, not one swear, not one profanity, not one losing anger or anything. Massive uh, shift. Massive shift. I never drank anymore. Just, Just like, like that. that. The only thing I struggled with was cigarettes. Smoking, yeah. I struggled with that for a while. And when he came home to your... Well, family. I actually called her up from there because you could phone from Yeah. There. From, it was in Brunei, offshore Brunei. Yeah. Uh, I phoned her up and I said, we need to change our life. And she said, well, I haven't done anything. What do I, why should I change my life? She thought, I haven't robbed or stolen or hurt yeah. anyone. Or I said, oh, no, you, you don't, you, I'll tell you when I get home. So when I got home, I, I, uh, I said, look, I'm, I'm changing my life. That's it. We're, I'm moving. She said, well, what, what do I, you know, she didn't really understand it. So the next time I went back to work, when she got naturalised as an Australian citizen, here, yeah, it was in 83, I think, uh, she, um, she, they, were, they were offering her a Bible or a portrait of the Queen. Well, the Queen didn't mean, mean much to a French woman. Yeah. So she took the Bible. And that Bible sat on our mantel of cupboard for, I don't think it was 10 years, well, yeah. seven years. Untouched. Untouched, dusted. So when I went back, she read the Bible from... Genesis to Revelation, but she read it like a storybook, you know, so she yeah. read it that way. And uh, when I came back the next time, she gave her heart to the Lord. But, yeah. She read it that quick? Well, she, yeah, she's a quick reader, but, yeah, she in three weeks she read it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's something. Yeah, she's probably skipped a lot of Leviticus, I think. Yeah. But the rest, yeah, she and read And the Chronicles. Oh, well, I don't know, maybe, she, but she read most of all the Bible. Wow. And then that, that really, something happened to so her. Did you go to a church to get baptised? Or what did well, you we, 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 we then, the second time, we had a friend who was a Christian. She, yeah. she had a friend that she knew was a Christian, and she was Church of Christ from Warwick. And so we went there for the first um, year of our life. I actually yeah. got, um, I actually got, um, in, in September... I gave my heart to the Lord in April and September the 30th, I, I got water baptised by the pastor. And so we both did together. That's beautiful. Yeah, it was. It was and there was a testimony there, but I won't go into it because, you know, the Lord stopped the, the rain for us and sunshine and then rained after we got baptised. But In the ocean? No, no, in, a, in Vince Tilly's pool, okay. the guy that led me to the Lord. Oh, in his pool at home. Yeah, yeah, he was living in Wanneroo at the time, wow. at the back there. So then Janine, uh, the thing was she uh, really 
really took off with the Lord as well. And uh, by that next February, she there was a, there was an evangelist that came through and about about speaking in tongues. And um, I mean, I was ready. I was ready. I thought, and yeah. she um, she actually thought she'd rather do it at home privately. Yeah, and she did. I went to the shop for half an hour and I came back and she she was like a giggling little girl, <laughs> and 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 I was I was sort of not offended, but I just didn't take it very well because I was not. I thought I was back, I was born again first. So with me, it took about a couple of years before I really got filled filled with the, well filled with the evidence of tongues. Yeah. yeah, we've all got the spirit, but whether it's activated is yeah. not activated is with tongues switched so switched on. Yeah. So then that was that was it, and then that was in yeah. So nineteen ninety was really the year that that I gave my heart to the Lord in about April nineteen ninety. And, and still so, in, in the Church of Christ. Well, we we stayed in the Church of Christ, but then the Lord we we moved to the Kingsley Church of Christ because our daughter joined the girls' brigade there and all that. But then there was something else that happened there was that after six months there, the Lord moved us on to a spirit-filled church, to an AOG church. Mm -hmm. And how he did that was quite phenomenal because I was a very heavy sleeper and my wife was a pin drop she'd hear because of the children. She was very attuned to that. And so one night, uh, I heard the... It was like a jump... A 747 was about 20 feet above our house with full engines (laughs) roaring. And and I, 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 I told her, did you hear that? And she said, hear what? She didn't hear it. I thought she was playing with me. But she said, no, I didn't hear it. And then I went back to bed or tried to, and then the voice kept saying, go and read Psalm 150. Mm-hmm. I thought, there's no Psalm 150. I'd never read the book of Psalms. Not that far. And uh, so I went and read. Eventually, I, after arguing with this voice that was in my head telling me to go and read it, I went and read it at 2 in the morning, and, and it said that we needed to praise him with everything. Yeah. Worship him with everything, and unfortunately, the Church of Christ was a bit reserved in that yeah. area. So then, we were, then Vince Tilly was going to the Girouin AOG, and that's yeah. where we went, and we stayed there for seventeen years. Wow! I met uh, Malcolm Smith there in '92. You know, when we started Menorah Church, we started in the hall there for a year. Upstairs, yeah, up in the upper hall. Yeah, yeah, that was there. That was so. The, before we came to this since, facility, since, oh, you had that upper hall. Yeah. Wow. For one year? Well, yeah. well, that's when my daughter was baptised in the spirit at eight years old with a, with a team from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They came through and, and they, they got all the children and said, who, do you want, who wants the Holy Spirit? They all put up their hand. And my daughter was speaking in tongues at the age of eight years old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so... And she's still doing it now? Well, then she met a husband who was not really that way and so they went to... Anglican churches and stuff like that, and so she let it go. But now she's back into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah my son was born again as well. My oldest son. Yeah. At fourteen, he was he was at crossroads. He saw. He thought this is just a fad that dad is in. He's going to change. He's going to go back to what he was. You know, with barbecuing and all his friends. But he saw that it wasn't. At fifteen, he was really challenged by the Lord because a lot of his friends. He was going to. We put him in Lake Juno Baptist College at that yeah. time. And he's, a lot of his friends were then starting to go into drinking and partying and drugs. And he was at a crossroad and then he chose to not to do that. Yeah. And he became, and he was born again. Now he's a, he plays the league guitar in the worship team at, uh, at uh, he started at, Sh- at North City. He started with us at Girawin, then he moved on to North City, North City when it was North City or Shiloh. Yeah. And then uh, he's, he's been a, He'd been to Kingdom City for a while, and then he's gone back to back to C three. C three, yeah. Is that where you are now? No, hmm. we 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 uh, we stayed in Girawin for uh, seventeen years, and then we moved to Malcolm started a church. Yeah, Malcolm Smith started a ten, a ten challenge type church, and he wanted us there, and we did, but it, we, that's not where the Lord wanted us, and so we uh, we took time out and. And for, well, we went and moved to we went to Reg's church for a while, Reg Marias. Yeah, if you know behind him. the world. Yeah, and so we we really were there on his infancy, and yep. in, he, he never had a church at the time. He was in Challenge Stadium, and then we we were there for a purpose, I think. Yeah. Because Reg was very reluctant to 
get it, get a building. Yeah. And so. Well, they're building one now. Yeah. No. Yeah. But in those days, uh, there was there was quite amazing because the congregation there was about sixty people that came to that church. Yeah. For that specific purpose to get that uh, inner loot church for yeah. him, and and raise funds because he wasn't into it. He didn't agree with that. Not agree with it, but he was very reluctant to. Yeah. That. And so uh, when that happened, after it was fine, you know, been there, we, we'd only been there three years, we, then many were leaving. Mm-hmm. And all those 60 that came for that purpose had left. Okay. And so we didn't want to be like them, so we stayed, but we stayed too long. So then we went to, um, I went, I, I used to go to Without Walls in my earlier Christian yeah. walk. And so we went there and, well, we actually stayed home for four months and asked the Lord, where, where do we need to go? Sure. Because we, we knew we'd been visiting all those churches before, years before uh, Riverview and Victory and, and all the all yeah. the churches we'd yeah. been to. And uh, we knew what they were like. And so we just asked, wanted to, the Lord to put us into a church, yeah. not just go for convenience. Yeah. So we went to um, we went to Without Walls and we've been there now eight years now. Wonderful. And that's a good place to minister as well because yeah. it's a very outreach focused church. It is. It's it different. Is. It's role. It's happening. Yeah, and I think that's where the Lord wants me really is to encourage young men. Yeah, I think that's yeah. You know, we all have a purpose and a and a plan, and He has a purpose and a plan and destiny for each one of us. And I guess that's the 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 the, the ideal is to find that that purpose and plan that he wants to have for you and and he does he does have one he has a plan for everyone and, and jeremiah 29 11 says it and it's so true that god has a specific plan for you yeah that only you and if you you choose not to do it then no one else can do that that's right but you can do and so i think that's for me i mean I, i've been in a lot of church positions yeah and boards yeah and and uh only because of the business he gave me. And that's that's what really I want to talk about is to the business the Lord gave me after the oil rigs finished yeah. uh, in 95. Um, I, I, by 95, the Lord had brought me from the lowest position on an oil rig yeah. to the highest. Praise God. And I, and I didn't have the education to do it. Mm. And it was quite amazing what he did because, uh, because of the experience I had in Brunei, eight years of... Bring, drilling a well and bringing that well actually to production. Yeah. That, that was vast experience. Um, I got a job with Apache Energy and, and Wapit Drilling and, and Chevron and and all these Big names. as supervisor. <clears throat> and so that was that was amazing what the Lord had done because he did I, I really struggled with that because I, I was telling the Lord every morning, you know, before or night before going to work that um, this was beyond me, but he would he wouldn't answer anything, and so he'd say, "You're ready to go to work," <laughs> and so it was it was really amazing what he did. And then after that, that finished in ninety ninety six. Yeah, and in ninety seven, I tried to get work. My I had a had a consultant agency that was trying to get work for me. Yeah, we got no no carry on uh, around the world, and they couldn't get me any work. So I only job I could get was as a salesman. And that's sort of on the, in the oil rigs. But, and so that took me from the highest to the back. Up, back to the lowest. <laughs> and so for two years I was on that. And I worked as an as a ex- exclusive consultant for an Aberdeen company in Australia to an agent. And the agent wasn't doing the right thing by this company. And so I was telling them to open up. I was selfishly telling them to open up a subsidiary so I'd be their manager. But uh, because they procrastinated... Laws had changed, so they then said, "We will. We want you to open up a business." So yep. the Lord had a better plan, <laughs> because if I was a manager, it was limited in what He could do with me. Yeah. But because He, he opened up a business for me, yes. He could do everything for it. Yeah. If it would be for the kingdom business, and so that's what happened. That's what happened. And you opened a business. I opened a business up in the year 2000. And January the first year 2000, the day of N- Y2K. Y2K. <laughs> so I opened it up and, and he gave me the name for the business. He gave me the name of Pathfinder Resources Yeah. to find the path. And yeah. That was a pathfinder in the drilling as well, yes. find the path. But find the path to him. 
and he also gave me a scripture to start off with, and and it, and 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 I still use it to today. And it was Deuteronomy eight eighteen. Earnestly remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the power to get wealth to establish His covenant, not your big house, not your big this. Yeah. Just and so you give it all to Him. Yeah. And then He 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 provides all your needs. Every need will be met. Yeah. Every need will be met. We've got to surrender things. We don't realize that a lot of people are reluctant to surrender what they have. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that they're withholding the blessing that he pours. It could pour upon us, and so it li- we limit him. Mm. We limit him on how what he can do in our lives. And so I learned that, and I experienced it. And it was the more I gave, the more he gave back. Mm. It was like a flow in, flow out. Yeah. And that's what the Lord wants us and. Then he gave me that revelation and when I looked at the map of Israel and saw the, the Jordan flowing into the Sea of Galilee, yep. which was teeming of life and everything, yep. and then flowing out. Yes. And but into the Dead Sea, which didn't everything have to flow stops. out and everything died. Dies, yeah. So I think it was a really good analogy uh, to tell others that, you know, God, you can't out give God. God That's is right. always a giver. He gave his son. Yeah. I mean, that's priceless. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so from that, the business thrived. I mean, the business prior to that as a consultant, it was average. Yeah. But once he had the business, yeah, it just multiplied it exponentially. Mm. I mean, it was beyond what I could ever envision. Yeah. And and it was for his glory. And then, but it was a, a learning, it was only until 2008, until all these big conglomerates bought this company out in Aberdeen. Yes. And then the, and we went to court because they owed us a lot. Of, I overpaid on my royalties mm-hmm. and we wanted it if, if we were going to settle, but they were not willing to give me that. And so they hired a big law firm, the biggest law firm Australia's got, Allen, Allen, Allen's and Allen's law firm. And we had a little uh, <clears throat> commercial lawyer from Osmond Park and my, my accountant with me. And yeah. we went to mediation. And yeah. The Lord looked after me there as well because I was able to get into the into the into the court into the mediation room in the courtroom. It was actually a courtroom, and above I saw it was Mon Dieu and Mon Dieu. So Mon Dieu and Mon Dieu is French for my my God and my right. Mm-hmm. And so I prayed in that room before they all come in. Then they brought in their battery of QCs and yeah. and uh, senior barristers and all that. And so the mediator, the Lord also organised because she was uh, she had been the legal head for Woodside for twenty years, oh, so she understood the oil fields. She understood the oil fields. Yeah. So she could knew we couldn't get a, a a decision, so she separated us. And prior to that, it was for two and a half years that law firm dragged it on. Yes. It should have been completed in a year, but prior to that. The Lord got me to put the, the amounts of money in different accounts yeah. in, in the a p which they weren't aware of those bank accounts. Yes. Separated. Yeah. Two and a half years later when we settled, it was exactly what the Lord told me to put around. Yeah. Exactly what we were going to pay them. Yeah. They were going for everything. Yeah. But they only got but that amount. Yeah. That was put aside for them. Praise God. Yeah, that's, I mean, the Lord. The hand of huge. God. Amazing, amazing. And now you have another business with this. I do, but it's it's my, and I, it hasn't thrived like the Pathfinder. Yeah. Pathfinder, God created that business. This one was born out of me, basically. And so it, it's it's not, well, I haven't put the time in either because I know that to run a business, that you, you need to actually put in a lot of time. And I'm sure. not, I don't know if I'm ready to commit all that time. I'd rather commit that time to him. Yeah. And so I haven't put in the time for the work. But I still think that this business, although it has ex- great potential. So this is an additive. It's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's not really an additive. It's a, it's a micro oil metal treatment. It treats metal. It doesn't add to anything okay. except treat the, the metal, micro, the micro pores of the metal. In, so, in engines. In engines, in any type, anything that's lubricated. Yeah. But the thing is, is that um, uh, it has great potential, but... Um, I I just see it as a tent ministry. Really. Yeah, yeah, it's to keep you going. Yeah, yeah it's it actually doesn't even. You feed spoke us. about men's ministry and uh, the mm. call of God that you have towards that. Is that the legacy that you'd like to be connected with? It is. 
It is. I like I like to encourage the men mm -hmm. to tell them, the young men, that God has a specific plan and purpose for their life. Yeah. And for them to make it a a desire to fulfill all the tasks and assignments that he has planned and purposed for them. Yes. And as, as they seek that, he will protect them to, to bring out the final outcome of their destiny. Mm -hmm. And so I really want to encourage the people in that area is to, is to seek him and what he wants for your life. And he'll, he'll always give you what you need. He'll always provide your need for it. And he'll, he'll, it's a striving and a struggle when you try and work out. Without him. Without him. Yeah. And, and try and try this or try that. If you're constantly trying things, it, it basically is, is, you'll be struggling and striving <coughs> to, to achieve things. Maybe we should call this podcast Stop Trying and Start Allowing. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it's allowing him to have his way. And, and you know, the, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and God is a loving Father. And he won't tell us to do things. Yeah. He, he wants us to ask him. He wants us to surrender, to, to, to ask him, to lead, ask him to lead us and guide us. And, and I don't know, it's a cliche thing, mold us and shape us into the, but that's what we need to do is let the yeah. Holy Spirit have his way. And, and you know, when I, when I did that business for eight years, I learned to take God to work. Yeah. Take God to work. Doing business yeah. with God, I yeah. called it. Yeah. And then we used to do business breakfast with Reg Marais. And he, he'd do prophecy on that. But the thing was to take God to work with you, or whatever you yeah. do, get the Holy Spirit involved in everything you're doing. He, he won't push his way in, but he wants you to rely on him, yeah. and then he will lead you and guide you the way you should go. Wonderful. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful legacy, and if you can manage that's, to inspire yeah. people to seek God and allow God to be God in their lives, I think that's yeah. it's a massive plus for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Thanks it so is. much for sharing this beautiful story with us okay. and your testimony, John. Well, it's a pleasure. So it's a pleasure to, to give him glory. Amen. Yeah, really. Well, what a beautiful story. I'm sure that this has inspired you. Um, no matter what challenges you are going through, stop trying and allow God to be God. And mm. uh, do your business with God and then do the other business because God is in everything. Mm. I pray that this story inspires you and helps you carry on the good walk with the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> I do have a bit of a sore throat and uh, I had to take some water along the path. Uh, in this uh, podcast um, do excuse me but we managed to get to the end of it uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we can smile about it now if you love this podcast please share it with other people on both YouTube and the other podcast platforms wherever you are watching or listening to this content thank you so much for joining us and uh, we invite you next week when you'll hear another beautiful story at Kingdom Stories from Down Under Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.